to lead in prayer. How about Kannan? Kannan, I haven't heard your voice also in a long time. How are you doing? Yes, ma'am. Am I audible? Okay. Yeah, yeah, very much. Very much. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Kannan. Yes, yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, the Lord, I thank you for this wonderful time, oh Lord. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity, Lord. Lord, I pray for this surging and uh, all, all of us, Lord. Lord, I pray for her hands in her mouth and give her a good uh, knowledge, knowledge to teach us and also give us a good understanding and, uh, from your uh, word. Lord, Lord, uh, help everybody to join on time, Lord. Lord, uh, now uh, until the end, uh, you should, your uh, Holy Spirit should give us a uh, good guidance, Lord. Lord, um, I, I thank you for this wonderful day, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Kandan. It's good to uh, have you pray. Uh, thank you for opening out this time. Uh, right through prayer and how are things uh, in your place how is the covid situation yeah <clears throat> yeah normal only okay getting better is it yeah yes oh, okay good. yeah everybody getting vaccinated yeah that's really important <laughs> yeah. i also i also do. oh okay you finished both both the doses no 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 one, no first one First one. Oh, okay. I am okay. mine is coming uh, October. October. Okay. Good, good, good. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. I hope uh, the others also uh, can get the vaccines. It's really helpful. In fact, I got mine two days ago, uh, but this is my second dose. So, by God's grace, both uh, as of now. And hopefully, that will be helpful. Okay, so uh, fine. Let's uh, let's proceed. Uh, yeah. So we are studying uh, from the book of Acts, and in the last class we talked about Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, we, initially, right when we saw that uh, the church was birthed, the Holy Spirit was poured out, everything was so exciting. Okay, felt like wow, revival is here. Uh, the church is meeting often, people are sharing their things, uh, and the Holy Spirit is performing wonderful miracles among the people. And it seemed like this setting is so perfect. Nothing can go wrong in this setting. Okay, So we, we saw external challenges. So initially, in Acts 3, when Peter and John step out and they minister to the lame man, uh, they laid hands on them. And they uh, interrogate them, they threaten them. So it's an external challenge. So in the midst of an external challenge, the attitude of the church is to uh, be bold. So they pray and they say, Lord, let more miracles, let more of the supernatural be done through our lives. So that kind of a bold attitude the, the people of God carry. Uh, and they all cry out to God. So they are in one accord and they continue strongly before the Lord. Uh, then while things are still kind of perfect and there's only external challenges, suddenly we read about Ananias and Sapphira. The church is doing so well. We understand that uh, spiritually uh, there are a lot of wonders, miracles which are being done through the hands of the apostles. Uh, at the same time, you know, you, you find that the people in the church Okay. Uh, unfortunately, this couple, they did not have the right heart attitude towards God. And they did not even fear God. Uh, and they went to the extent of lying to the Holy Spirit. And they thought that they would ne never be found out. But we said that when there is the greater glory of God, you know, sins also are exposed faster. So in this case, their sin of misappropriating money, funds, uh, was found out and uh, uh, Peter through the Holy Spirit recognizes it and the moment he issues a rebuke both of them die okay and uh, what would you expect to happen 
uh, when when somebody in the church has experienced this kind of an immediate judgment, we would think that you no know, people will not come back to church, right? Because they might be afraid. Oh, what is going on? Uh, uh, we should never come back into this environment. But we read that the church only became stronger, and more and more people uh, actually were added to the church. So that's where that's where we were, and we saw that uh, you know the, the lot of miracles and all were happening through the church and the apostles, and people were being added. Okay, so when uh, there is righteousness in the house of God, okay, when there is uh, the right judgment of God, okay, in the house of God, what can we expect? We can expect the spirit of God to work powerfully and people to be touched. So it's a time of great glory. We can put it like that: great glory because uh, miracles, signs, wonders. Okay, uh, the the. Uh, the gifts of the spirit. See how Peter, through the gifts of the spirit, he was able to to recognize then the the unity of the church, the growth of the church. So much of the work of God. So what is glory? Glory is the nature of God being revealed. So the nature of God, the greatness of God, is being revealed through the church. And we also read that among the people there was great fear. Oh, who are these people? Uh, you know, seems something different from the regular traditional uh, uh, Jewish communities that they knew. They knew, hey, these are the followers of Jesus, and something powerful is happening in their midst. Then uh, there was great respect. Okay, great respect, great glory, great judgment. You know, we saw that also. So, so many dynamics. Within the church, but this time around, it's not just the external trouble, but internally, you know, people with wrong attitude were uh, uh, judged by God. So internally also, there are challenges. Now we, I was just uh, talking to one of us and asking, "Would are you going to be a pastor?" So uh, you know, there is an aspiration to be a pastor. So I am sure, you know, different ones of us here, we, we want to serve in different capacities. And we might want the church to be perfect, isn't it? So external problems, yes, we can handle. What about uh, internal challenges? We don't want internal challenges. And in a growing church, in a church where there is the glory of God, uh, you know, we really don't want even the thought of having issues uh, doesn't seem holy. But... This is the practical side of things. And that wherever there are people, there will be problems, right? Uh, not as a prophecy, but just, you know, but, or let me put it this way, wherever there is growth, people are experiencing growth and maturity, there will be challenges because they are going through those stages. So even the book of Acts, you know, things seem to start out so perfect that you notice external issues. Now, one internal issue we have seen, Ananias and Sapphira. And after that happens, praise God, nothing stopped the church, but the church is still growing, growing to the extent that once again they are brought under trial. Okay, Why? Because you find that the uh, authorities were insecure. They felt threatened by this thriving church. Okay, And uh, as the apostles stand before, the the authorities are uh, this time around okay this time around how is it that the authorities are going to deal with them initially they severely threatened them and they left them this time they put them in the prison but look at the supernatural intervention of god see this also is something for us to encourage us what what is that though these people are being caught do you see god's help last time through the authorities themselves. I don't know what Peter and John were thinking. They must have thought, oh, it's over. We might get killed today. But thank God they were released. This time, an angel right, came and opened up the prison. So God is working for them. God is working with them. So when we are, uh, 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 what do you say, like when we are serving God, what can we expect? We can expect God's help, isn't it? So it is only God uh, who 
will protect us, guide us and lead us. Same way, these apostles had God's help. The angel came and opened the prison. And they are so strong in serving and following God that the instruction of the angel was go back to the temple and continue to preach the gospel. So they boldly go back. And that is the place from where they are caught again. Okay. And we, we find that uh, again there is a trial. And, you know, uh, the authorities are thinking what to do with these people. So let's go back to our uh, text here. We were at, uh, let us come back to that verse. I think I started sharing a little bit about Gamaliel. Oh, yeah. We also saw in the glory of God, we saw how Peter's shadow right, uh, was also considered to heal people. So people were coming from all over the place. So the church is really flourishing and thriving. There's angelic visitations. Okay, if you want to look at it that way also. So there's great glory in the church. Okay, fine. So now uh, we will start off from we'll start off from verse 20. Uh, yeah, let's again start from verse 24. It will help us. Okay, so when the high priest, the captain of the temple, the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. Okay, so the authorities are threatened by it. Uh, and uh, uh, one came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. And the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence. Uh, so you see, even the politicians, of their times, uh, these, these you could call them as politicians, they wanted the uh, approval of the people. So that's why they were so careful. See, if they wanted, they could have immediately killed the apostles. Okay, But they don't want to get into the bad books of the people. That is why they are doing things in a very, very, um, uh, you know, sort of a cautious way. Okay. Uh, and, and that's what we are observing here. So they went again, brought them. And when they had brought them before the council, uh, high priest asked, didn't we strictly command you not to teach in this name? Okay. And I told you earlier that this name of Jesus was problematic for the authorities. How problematic that they did not even mention. So they could have just said, uh, didn't we... Uh, warn you last time not to preach in the name of Jesus but see the way Luke records it now Luke is saying that they just said uh, we warned you not to teach in that in this name so not even the mention of the name of Jesus now and look you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us but in a way you know even though this is supposed to be part of interrogation and threatening it's actually a compliment. Okay. You have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Just think about it. In our times, it's so much easier, right? We have all the um, uh, uh, social media and technology to put out the message. But in those times, you know, your initially they started out as 120 people, then 3,000 people were added. And the city of Jerusalem, it seems like uh, the word and the message was spreading super fast. How is it possible without technology? You could only refer back to the passion which they carried, right? And the power of the Holy Spirit which they had. Through that, they were able to uh, take the message far and wide. And even the authorities are saying, your doctrine is spread all across Jerusalem. So it's a great thing. You know, that's what they wanted. And that was actually happening. So it's a compliment. Now, standing before the authorities, this is for the second time. The second time Peter is standing. And you see here, uh, Peter and the other apostles, we expect them to be scared. 
Okay, we expect them to respond with fear, but what is their answer? They say we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to His right hand to be Prince and Savior. Okay, so uh, notice every opportunity that Peter has, whether he's standing in front of the people. You know, after the uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit, he preached to those who had gathered. After the healing or the miraculous recovery of the lame man, Peter preached. He's standing in front of the authorities. He's actually preaching. Preaching what? The message of the gospel. What is the message of the gospel? The Lord Jesus, right? The sin of mankind. the death and resurrection of jesus christ the forgiveness of sins okay so you notice even in this opportunity standing in front of the council what is he doing he is proclaiming about jesus yes he begins by saying that you murdered jesus whom you murdered by hanging on a tree but he says god has exalted Him right at his right hand to be prince and savior. So what does that tell you? He is proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah, savior, right? The anointed one, the one who will save Israel. And then he says to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So he is actually preaching the gospel. Now who knows? Somebody from one of the uh, one of the people in that group. Might respond to this message, and we don't know till today whether they did or they did not. But every opportunity by the early church was taken to proclaim the gospel. So you know that shows us what a passion, what a passion they are carrying everywhere. Without fear, they are obeying God and they are preaching the gospel, and they are bold enough. You know, I remember we said witness means what? Like martyrs, martyrs is to be bold enough to die. So they're saying, and we are witnesses. Okay, we are we are witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. So you know they are talking about the the work of God, and they are trying to bring the attention to the authorities that whatever we are doing, we know that you are blaming us, but He brings in Holy Spirit. He says, "This is God." Okay. And uh, uh, that's what we we want to let you know. This Jesus is Messiah, and this is God that you are dealing with. So then the authorities hear this. Obviously, they understood what they are trying to say because just now, on the same basis that Jesus was claiming to be, you know, what was the accusation against him? King of the Jews, right? Or um, like like the ruler. Again, they are saying Prince and Savior. So, as they're proclaiming Jesus as the Lord and Savior, the authorities are offended, and it says they are furious. They are very angry. Uh, earlier, they thought, okay, let's not get blood on our hands. Recently, that man Jesus died. So, once again, getting into killing the uh, disciples of Jesus won't be a good thing. However, they were so furious. It says they plotted to kill them. So now, uh, the trouble from outside is doubling and tripling. Okay, why you think? Wow, God is doing a great work in the church. We don't expect anything to go wrong, right? And I'm not saying expect things to go wrong when things are going right uh, in in the kingdom. But you see, we live in a fallen world. Okay. and um, even when we preach the gospel no matter how uh, uh, you know how sensitively we preach the gospel we know paul wrote about it he said that the message itself can be an offense to the people and in this case the authorities are so offended that they finally decide you know what the thing we have to do is to get rid get rid of we got rid of jesus let's just get rid of his disciples okay and you can uh, just imagine you know how difficult it must have been for the early church to have 
the authorities threaten them for the truth which they are experiencing that is difficult isn't it that uh, you have to be a witness uh, in in such an opposing um, environment but praise god for the power of the holy spirit right the baptism of the holy spirit that enable them to be witnesses even during this kind of a time now moving on we saw there was a pharisee by the name of gamaliel now we must also understand that the um, council or, or or the authorities were a combination like you had the chief priests you had some uh, you know different different uh, uh, capacities of of authorities who had come together so pharisees and they would have also had some sadducees and you know others in the uh, group there but one of them was very well respected uh, by the name of gamaliel he was a teacher of the law and held in high respect by all people so uh, because he was so well respected his words were he did too and he commanded them to put the apostles outside for a while so what's happening you know we usually have a like a huddle when you're having your uh, football match uh, when the game is not going so well or you know you have break time the the people the players will come they they have this uh, huddle and then they'll discuss okay now do this do that so in that way uh, gamaliel says okay leave those apostles aside come let's discuss what to do about these people okay it's getting out of hand now okay and they're having this discussion but see this how god works even through you could say unbelieving authority okay uh what is gamaliel saying obviously he is not somebody who has accepted christ at all but he say men of israel take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men okay and then he points to a man called theodos in his story this this person was uh, you know somebody like a leader among the people who had a lot of influence so what he did is he uh, uh, like you know he led the people 400 people joined him 400 men joined him okay and uh, he was slain and all who obeyed him were scattered okay and they came to nothing so basically uh he is saying there was another person like you know who created such a lot of trouble in the city but what happened to him ultimately there were 400 people who followed him but you know, we were able to take care of that situation isn't it he was obviously he was killed and uh, all the people who followed him were nowhere after he was killed so after this man another person judas of galilee rose up in the days of senses and drew many away many people away from him but what happened to him he also perished and all who obeyed him were dispersed okay and now i say to you keep away from these men and let them alone so this is the decision which is coming from an unbelieving leader he say don't worry a lot of people rise up but what happens to each one of them sooner or later you know they die their followers are nowhere to be seen so don't worry about these people also because if this is a work of man okay which was what happened to theodos which was what happened to judas of galilee it's not a big deal same thing will happen to these people they will be nowhere in some days he says if it is a work of man what will happen if it is a work of man it will come to nothing but notice what gamaliel says the last part of verse 39 he says but if it is god because these disciples were claiming right and they were saying jesus god holy spirit so they were bringing god into the picture and gamaliel wonders hey is it possible that this can be a work of god so he says if it is work man's work like all the others they will perish but if this is a work of god then what will happen he says guys i don't think we can handle it if it is god so he says if it is of god you cannot overthrow it 
lest you even be found to fight against God. So you see the openness in the heart of a scholarly man. You would wonder, is it even possible that an unbelieving person can say something like this? But you know, God is at work, isn't it? So when the apostles are caught in such a uh, difficult position, through uh, one of the main leaders, God is at work, right? And with such clarity, he says, don't fight God. If it is God, neither you nor I nor anybody can do anything about what is happening in Jerusalem. Okay, So maybe Gamaliel, I don't know, maybe he also felt that it could be God's work. We have no clue, right? But this is what was happening in Jerusalem. People were all uh, in a state of chaos. Who is this Jesus? Why are his disciples like this? Why is everyone following Jesus? How are these miracles happening? In whose name? Oh, they found out these people are doing it in the name of Jesus. And earlier, Peter and John said that in the name of Jesus, right? Rise up and walk. So the authorities are saying, please don't use that name. Something about that name of Jesus. But think about it. What a witness. What a witness the church of Jerusalem is to the city of Jerusalem. Okay? Um, that their doctrine spread so fast. And even the greatest scholar of the times is saying, if it is God's work, you cannot stop what God is doing. Okay? So that is the manner in which, which the work is going on in Jerusalem. Now, let's move forward here. So what, what did the authorities do? They agreed with him. right? Uh, and when they uh, called the apostles once again, obviously, like, right like earlier, they had gone uh, away from the apostles to discuss all this. Now, when the apostles have come back, they decide, okay, we need to still threaten them. So this time, the apostles were beaten. Okay. See, it, it's going from bad to worse. Earlier, it was verbally threatening. This time, physically. And we, we know that, uh, you know, the kind of uh, punishments that used to exist uh, under the uh, Roman Empire, then it was not something very simple here. It just says beaten, but obviously they would have been beaten badly. Okay, and again, they were commanded. You should never speak in the name of Jesus. Okay. And they let them go. They thought, okay, chalo. If we um, threaten them in this way, maybe they will stop from proclaiming the gospel. Now, the apostles move away, right? Uh, and earlier, when they were threatened, what was their uh, reaction when they were threatened? Do you recall? What was their uh, heart attitude? When, we, when they were threatened last time? Do you remember? They were not afraid. They, yeah. They said so that they would obey the, the word of the Lord rather than of the, 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 the leaders. Correct, correct. And what did they pray for? They went and told their brethren and they all prayed together. What did they pray for? Just recall a little bit. I told you, they all prayed together for something. Very good. Boldness. Isn't it? So they prayed for boldness. So when persecution happens, and we are filled with the Holy Spirit, and we are doing the right thing, okay? When we are doing the right thing, what can we expect? We can expect to carry the same right attitude in the midst of persecution. So the early church demonstrated boldness earlier. This time around, let's see what they are uh, saying. So they are saying, uh, you know, it, it, the, the verse is, they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing. Okay, earlier boldness. This time, rejoicing. 
that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name okay so can you imagine can you imagine going through persecution and thinking okay i did the right thing but i got punished but wow what a privilege that i could go through shame i could go through suffering right for the name of jesus how many of us would have the uh, heart to do that we might come back complaining god why did this happen to me i am serving you faithfully how can these um, you know the authorities question us we are preaching in the name which is above every other name so complain we can complain we can feel sad we can feel disappointed discouraged so many negative emotions can go through us but look at the early church the apostles it says they came back rejoicing rejoicing right that they were counted worthy to go through sufferings they wow it's it's incredible it's incredible how they could have that kind of an attitude and then they continue with their work so once you are threatened what do you do you try to be safe but not these people you find them it says and daily in the temple authorities would have been like what is this we threatened you we beat you and what are you doing again daily in the temple it says and in every house work is not stopping they are continuing to pray continuing to worship continuing to glorify god everywhere so they had these two um settings where they would meet so the early church they had them you could say maybe the larger uh, group met at the temple but apart from that they also met house to house something like a cell group setting so they found their own you know what works for them that setting uh, and they had that structure and they would meet very often it says daily and it says they did not cease teaching and preaching jesus as the christ the first not that they wanted to disobey the authorities but they made themselves clear right they said look you only tell us should we listen to you or should we listen to god so because the authorities were uh, saying something which was against what god wanted for them they did not obey the authorities but we also know it's the same bible that encourages us to honor our authorities and to keep the law given by the authorities as well so by default that's what we do but when we are um forced to go against god that's when you know we have to stand up for what is right now let's continue so i i told you about external pressures that are happening in the church and internal challenges as well so we will read about another internal challenge this time in acts chapter 6 so acts chapter 6 i think this is familiar because we have dealt with this uh, in in a couple of other courses so we are start, we are looking at the emergence of the church we are looking at the emergence of church structure uh, in this uh, particular chapter and we are seeing how the leaders of the church are dealing meticulously right uh, with with every aspect of the church so what do we see here see basically in this chapter we notice that the church is growing it's multiplying okay and as a part of the church you have a group of people um like the the jews who are hebrew speaking and you have the greek speaking jews okay who are known as hellenists now there are two communities basically both are jewish communities but one uh, is from a certain culture the other is from another culture so cultural practices could be different and uh, you know the language obviously the hebrew speaking greek speaking jews so what happens it says in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying so it's a positive time for the church okay it's not at all a negative time the church is growing it's thriving in that time there is a difficulty within the church okay so encouragement for the pastors and the ministers if you know you're seeing great glory of god god's work is going on beautifully but there are some challenges here and there don't get discouraged it is normal it's part of the growing up process same thing happens 
in the midst of the multiplication to communities, there is an issue. What is that? There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So a couple of things that we can see about the church here. Now, we don't know whether really uh, one set of widows were neglected or not, but it seems like the Greek-speaking Jews felt this way. Okay, uh, And if you go a little more into the you know, details of it, it's possible that uh, the Hebrew-speaking Jews who were more authentic, you know, who were more the people who followed all the, the rituals and the customs of, of you know, the Jewish culture, they probably were more like the you know righteous than thou kind of uh, people because they were better off than the Greeks. The Greek people they had Greek culture, so uh, you know the Hebrews might have looked at them like a little lower. Hey, who are these people? Kind of a thing. So uh, in the midst of these differences, right? We really don't know. If the Hebrews treated the, the Greeks badly, but it's the Greeks felt that that their widows were not receiving uh, food. And you see, the church, it's a growing church, it's a multiplying church. But it's also quite an organized church because you see a rhythm, you see a structure, you see some good administration. Um, earlier also, we saw that the materials were distributed according to the needs of the people in the church. So do the apostles um, take care of the people well? Definitely. It looks like that because just because the numbers are big, you know, when the numbers are big, sometimes it's hard to keep account of your believers. Who is this person? What are their, uh, you know, what is their spiritual journey like? What are their needs? Because the church is so huge. But look at the the apostles here, they had some order. So it seems like they were taking care of everybody's needs. Here, the widows, they were being fed. And it says daily, right? Daily distribution. Yeah, daily distribution. Obviously, if you're not organized, then where is the question of daily distribution? Okay. And notice. There are two different communities today. Do we have communities, different communities in our churches? Yeah, we have different communities. Are all communities, um, uh, you know, the kind that will get along well with other communities? Not necessarily. So it's it's nothing unique what we are facing. The early church also faced it. Okay, and uh, it could be a perceived issue or it could be a real issue. Like. Uh, um, we, we are not, we don't know, but when a complaint like this comes, what can the leaders do? They could say, what a small problem. Why do you want to bring up all these problems? Look at the miracles that are taking place. You know, we just went and met the authorities and came, right? So we went to, uh, uh, like, for example, if you're in um, Bangalore or something, you'll be like, I just went to Vitan Sauda and came. What are you talking about giving food to the widows? Let's not deal with small matters. Okay. But that's not what the apostles do. They seem to be very sensitive to the needs of the people whom God has entrusted to them. Okay. So when the issue comes up, they don't neglect it. What do you see? It says the 12 summoned the multitude of disciples and said, so they called, they called the disciples and said, look, uh, we want a solution for this problem. It's not right that one community feels uh, neglected in the food, uh, like their widows are being neglected in the food distribution. So there has to be a solution. What solution are they looking for? So they say that we are quite busy right now. What were they busy with? The word of God. So primarily, the apostles now they're focusing more on the spiritual ministry aspect. Okay. Now it's not that they should not do the, the service kind of activities in the church. It's not like that. But they were more focused on the spiritual ministry by this time. And 
they said that, come on, now we cannot leave this because this also is a responsibility and then go and serve, right? So let's find a solution for this. And that would be to identify other people who can help with the food distribution. So we know what they did. They chose seven men and not just any seven men. Look at the qualification. Scriptures say uh, good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, right? They appointed over what? Over food distribution. Now you might think that the apostles have chosen volunteers. Today we call people like this who serve, you know, in, in different capacities, volunteers. So volunteers were chosen, but what is the need to find people of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom to do what? Serve food? But it was important in the early church. The testimony of the one who serves in church, right, was very important. So for that sake, for a regular task, you still find the apostles finding people who are strong spiritually, right? Having a good example in the community. And they were given this role and said, come on, now why don't you take care of distribution of food to the widows? And they committed themselves, it says, to, the, to prayer and ministry of the word. So there are, um, uh, you know, a set of volunteers who will uh, do this food distribution. The important thing to notice is that the apostles were keen to resolve issues in the church. Okay. And again, for pastors, leaders, it's very important. See, somebody might come up with an issue and uh, we might think it's not at all important. Why should I even deal with it? But to deal wisely with the matter early is, is good. Otherwise, what happens? You know, that small issue, it might become a bigger, bigger, bigger issue and create more division. Uh, people may come and worship, but you know, in their hearts, that problem is there. See, I told pastor, he never listened to me, right? He never resolved this problem. So we don't want to let those things fester. If we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be sensitive to the needs of the people, to the challenges that they are facing, and then you know, work it out in a, in a good way, it actually helps the growth of the church. Okay, So that's what we see the early church leaders doing here. So wisely, they came up with the idea of choosing seven people. Then uh, they told this to the, all the disciples. And you notice, it says, it pleased the whole multitude. So the church also liked the idea. They said, oh, great. Uh, if we choose our volunteers, I'm sure they will serve food equally to the Greek-speaking and the uh, Hebrew-speaking widows, Jewish widows. Now, in that list, who were the people, seven men who were chosen? There was one called Stephen. He was also a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. There was Philip. Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, right? And these were the people who were set to do this duty. Now, once these uh, volunteers are chosen, these apostles, what did they do? They prayed and they laid hands on them. Laid hands is a way of uh, sort of, you know, blessing them, commissioning them to do the task which uh, they are anointed to do. So the work is handed over. So uh, these are, this is the, the emergence of deacons in the church. Okay? Deacons, it's nothing but they are ministers and ministers referring to service. So they are not the people at this point who are serving in spiritual ministry, but physical, you know, physical logistics, administration kind of things they are taking charge of. But even when they are doing you know, administration and all that, uh, you notice that they were actually quite spiritual people, okay? Because full of faith, good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. These are all descriptions of people who are strong spiritually as well. So uh, spiritually strong people were chosen to distribute uh, the food in the early church. 
okay so i think i will uh, uh, stop at this point we will come back and we will pick up from uh, this portion uh, acts chapter 6 and i hope it's helpful are you all understanding is it uh, good are you able to take back something that you can practice and apply in your life okay nice nice great great wonderful so yes uh, so do meditate praise god uh, do meditate on these things think about these things you know it's very practical actually uh, the early church mm. so uh, as you serve god i'm sure you, know, you can um, definitely apply uh, this these principles and this way of working okay so at this point let's take a break we'll come back together and we will continue from the Uh, next course so see you in 10 minutes class thank you <laughs>